Welcome to the Breakthrough Success Podcast, helping you achieve that breakthrough you've always been looking for in your business. And now your host, Mark Guberti. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Mark Guberti, and this is the podcast for marketers and small business owners who are looking for the breakthrough for their businesses. I am very excited about this show. For episode 49 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast, we are going to talk about making the transition from job to online Amazon FBA empire with our guest, Ryan Grant. Ryan worked in the accounting field for a little over a year and a half before he decided to quit so he could create his own future. Ryan walked away from a $50,000 per year job and now crushes it with Amazon FBA and other platforms. Ryan trains other people how to do the same and everyone who has been in Ryan's programs for more than one year has made at least $100,000 in sales in 2016 with the top client eclipsing $1 million in sales in 2016 for the first time. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Ryan to the show. Thanks for having me, Mark. Glad to be here. Ryan, it's great to have you here. And I really look forward to taking a deep dive into your whole journey in Amazon FBA. But one thing I like to do is get some background info in the beginning. So can you give us some more details on why you decided to quit your job and what that whole transition was like? Sure. Yeah, so I I was I graduated from college in December of um, 2011, and then took a job as an accountant at, starting in January of 2012. Um, and I worked that job for about a year and a half. And about six months into that job, I pretty quickly realized that that wasn't what I wanted to be doing with my time. I found myself um, sitting in my cubicle or working in a client's office, working on accounting work, and I'd be basically not really enjoying what I was doing and just I would end up like daydreaming about having my own business or doing something else with my time and just being in control of my schedule. Um, So I pretty quickly realized that I wanted to step away from that and pursue my own business, do my own thing. So I would say about six months into that job is when I started kind of plotting my exit from the accounting world and giving setting myself up for being able to kind of run my own business. Um, and I felt that the easiest way out of that business or easiest way out of the accounting job was to do so via selling products via Amazon and eBay. Um, while I was in college, I had sold some textbooks, I'd sold some other products. So I, um, had some experience there knew I could make some money with it. Um, and I was confident that if I could dedicate full-time hours to it, that I would be able to, uh, really make a full-time income selling online. I mean, that was kind of my hypothesis. It wasn't proven at the time, but that was kind of my exit strategy from the corporate world in into my own business. So that's, that's a quick rundown of kind of how I first got started or first made the transition, but I can dive into more details on any of that if you'd like. It's really interesting how, I mean, you always had this thought of making a lot of revenue by selling. You had the experience in college and then you transitioned out of your job. And now, I mean, uh, you've been making a lot of revenue. Like in 2015, 2016, you mentioned in one of your blog posts that your business did well over a million dollars in sales each year on Amazon alone. And I mean, we see these like figures, like a lot of sales, a lot of revenue with the, wow, that's really incredible. But I feel like we don't really think as much about the behind the scenes things that happen as you uh, achieve those revenue numbers. So what was some of the behind the scenes work that you did to reach that level? Yeah, so it's definitely been a process to get up to the level of sales that we're doing today. And the from 2016 going forward, um, it kind of started in 2015. There's been more than just me working in the business too. I have I have a variety of team members who help me with all aspects. But I think what really helped to get to this level was I started out completely by myself um, in September of 2013 was when I finally did quit my job um, and started selling online full time. But what I what I what I've been trying to do the whole time was learn how to make money on Amazon. So I would test out a variety of different things, buying items in retail stores to sell on Amazon, buying items on online websites to sell on Amazon, working with liquidation and closeout companies, working with wholesalers and brands to buy their products um, via wholesale and then sell those on Amazon. So I've been testing out all of these things. And then whenever I find something that works, my goal is to systematize that and then outsource that to someone else on my team. So 
that's been a focus of mine from the beginning. And then that's really helped to make sure that I've been able to build. So I can, like say, buying items in retail stores to sell on Amazon. Um, I was able to figure out a good process to do that. And then I was able to have hire a team member to have them do that for me. And then I'm able to move on to another um, another piece of the business that can generate additional revenue. So say that's buying items at online stores and then systematize that. Um, so that's been kind of the framework. The goal has been able to mass, kind of master the process and then outsource it to team members. And then I can move on to a different angle of the business. So that's been um, that's been a big focus and that's some of the behind the scenes part. Another big piece though would be most of the money that comes into the business, especially for the first few years um, from about September of 2013 through the end of 2014 and most of 2015 too, um, I wasn't taking hardly any money out of the business. I was re reinvesting most of the money in inventory and uh, that really helped to compound growth. So the, pro the combination of keeping the money in the business along with creating processes and building a team were some of the key, the key things for being able to grow the business to this level of sales. And one of the things you mentioned is you did a lot of experiments with the products. You went to retail stores, you went to other online sites, you did wholesale. So you obviously have a lot of experience with trying to find the right products, being offered at the right deals. So how do you recommend deciding on which products you sell on Amazon? Yeah, I think so for people just getting started, I think something known as retail arbitrage is the best way to get started. Um, and effectively what that means is you're going into a big box retailer. It could be Walmart, Target, Toys R Us. could be a smaller type store that's in your area. And then you're looking for items that are on clearance or are sold at a discount. And in terms of like figuring out which ones make sense to sell, um, there's an app called the Amazon Seller app. It's free if you have an Amazon Seller account. And then it's going to give you information on how much the items are selling for on Amazon. And then it's also going to give you something called the sales rank on Amazon. And the sales rank is an indication of how well the item is selling on Amazon and how quickly it's selling. Effectively, the lower the number the sales rank is, the better that it's selling. So like the number one, the an item with a sales rank of one is selling at that point in time the fastest in its category. So what I, what I recommend for people just getting started and who want to learn the process, see if selling on Amazon is right for them is get the Amazon seller app and then go to retail stores, look for items on clearance um, and look for items where the sales rank is less than about 250,000. And then you also want to be able to get a 50% or more return on investment um, on what you're spending. So it's going to tell you all of this information in the app. So let's say the item is selling for $25 on Amazon. And then after fees and shipping, you're going to get paid $17 from Amazon, and then you can buy it um, in the store for 10. Your your profit would be um, the $17 payout from Amazon minus the 10, so your profit would be $7. And then you divide that by your initial investment of $10, so your return on investment would be 7, 70%. So that's kind of the way I recommend getting started. It's an easy way to get your feet wet, learn about the process with a relatively low upfront investment. And then from there, you can see if selling on Amazon is something that you really want to pursue yourself. And then there's a lot more ways to do it on a much larger scale that require more investment as well. But I think the retail arbitrage method is a great way to get started and learn the process. Thank you for sharing us a good way to get started with Amazon FBA. And there are a lot of different methods to branch out as you continue to learn more about the process. But behind all these tactics, and this is true for any type of uh, business strategy. Behind all the tactics are a set of principles that uh, there are like many tactics with few principles and knowing the principles helps you make that profit. So what are the basic principles for generating that profit through Amazon FBA? Yeah, so I think I touched on this one a little bit in the in the last answer, but I think the biggest thing is just knowing your numbers. Um, basically, every... Every item that you purchase, before you purchase it, you're going to know exactly what the fee structure is. You're going to know exactly how much you're paying for it. Um, and as long as you're doing the math ahead of time, it should be profitable. So in terms of uh, like principles, I think making sure you know your numbers is pretty much at the top of the list um, for me. And then 
if you want to grow your business quickly, another one would be reinvesting as much as possible in inventory because to continue to grow the business, you ultimately need more inventory and more inventory requires more capital. So if you continue to reinvest your profits, the, um, the amount of money and equity that you have in your business will continue to compound over time. Um, and then, yeah, factoring in the sales rank is can be a, like a, a good starting point for an initial principle too. Um, maybe that borders on a tactic, but if you stick to the lower numbers, especially initially in the sales rank um, end of things, that'll make sure that you're buying items that are going to sell in a relatively quick time frame and that you're not going to get bogged down with a bunch of inventory. So I'd say, honestly, though, knowing knowing your numbers and making sure those are going to be right uh, ahead of time, that's really the the main thing, I would say, for an FBA business. And you mentioned the sales rank as something important because, I mean, a popular product is easier to get that product out of the Amazon FBA warehouse, as I know there are certain fees if you keep it in the warehouse for too long. Are there Mm -hmm. any other ways that you get your products out of the Amazon FBA warehouse or does it all come down to the sales rank? Yeah, so sales rank is definitely an important piece of that. Um, But in terms of like getting products sold and into customers' hands out of the warehouses, we will do, we'll manage our pricing. Um, Typically we wanna be competitive with the lower end of the spectrum there. Um, And when I say that, there are some caveats that we want to compete with only other FBA sellers. So if sellers are doing something called merchant fulfilling their items, which means they're going to ship them from their own location, as opposed to using Amazon's fulfillment services, we don't want to compete with the merchant fulfilled sellers pricing. Um, We only want to compete with other FBA sellers. So we'll, we'll typically price um, slightly above the low FBA competition. Um, And the reason we do that is it gives us higher margins it makes sure that the other seller doesn't continually try to undercut our price if we were to price it the same or below their level. Um, and then it, it really doesn't slow down sell through too much either. So pricing is something we monitor. Um, we monitor like all of our feedback and making sure that that's um, as, as good as possible, making sure we're following all of Amazon's rules and that all of our metrics on the platform, all of those things help make sure that your items are seen more than your competitors. Um, We also run sponsored product ads, um, which is Amazon's own internal pay-per-click system for advertising your products. So you can target any keywords you want. And then whenever customers um, search for those terms, your products will be displayed as long as you have one of the highest bids for those products. Um, We also run a variety of promotions. Like you can say, if you buy three items from our storefront, you'll save 5% on your entire purchase purchase. We'll do things like that. Um, Those are are probably the main things, but making sure we're on top of pricing and buying items that have a a good sales rank, those are are definitely at the top of the list as well. And I really love with the pricing how you're not charging at the same price as the Mm -hmm. lowest competitor because then you get into a pricing war and it's a race to the bottom and margins really fall apart for both of you. So that is a very interesting strategy. And with the whole Amazon FBI, I mean, I feel some people are interested in it but then they think about they got to drive to the retail stores they got to hunt online so what are some hacks that can help us be more efficient with an amazon fba business yeah so there's definitely some time that goes into finding products to sell on amazon so if you're going to like a retail stores in terms of being efficient i would make sure that you have a solid um it's known as a scanning app which is effectively what the Amazon seller app is, you just use your cell phone, it uses the camera on your phone, and then it's going to give you pieces of information, um, like the net payout, how much you get paid from Amazon when the item sells, the sales rank, and things like that. There's other third-party apps that provide that information in a little bit easier to digest format. Um, So that helps with efficiency. You can see everything you need in one screen. Um, The one that I currently use the most often is called Scoutify, and that's made by a company called Inventory Lab. And then they also have an integration where you can save, as you're purchasing items to sell on Amazon, you can add them to a buy list um, on the app. And then when you're done, you can export that and then you can import it directly into Amazon. So that's going to save you time actually listing your products for sale on Amazon. So that's that's an efficiency there. If you're doing online arbitrage, um, 
which is buying items online to sell back on Amazon. Um, there's there's software that you can use for that. Um, there's Keepa.com, which is K-E-E-P-A.com is free. There's another one called CamelCamelCamel.com. Those are both like price history trackers on Amazon and they also do, uh, they track like some of the bigger price drops and they'll display those on their homepage. So sometimes those types of items can be good to sell on Amazon. And then there's a variety of other third party softwares that can help to automate the process too. Um, Tactical Arbitrage and OA X-Ray are a couple others that I use, but effectively what they're going to be doing is they filter through pages and pages of results on various retailers or online retailers websites. And then they let you know which ones can are, uh, are selling for more on Amazon, which ones have potential to make profit and things like that. So I think those would be some hacks and then just as you go along, figuring out what works and what doesn't, and then doing more of what works and making sure that you're focusing on those things as opposed to constantly reinventing the wheel would be, would be a few things. Ryan, thank you for sharing with us these great hacks that we can use to make the Amazon FBA business more efficient because I, efficiency is something we should all be striving towards. And with the Amazon FBA, I feel like some people view it more of a side hustle. You view it more of something full time because this is generating a lot more revenue for you than the average Amazon FBA business. So what is the difference in mentality? between using Amazon FBA as a successful side hustle and turning it into a full-time business? Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing there is really just deciding that you're going to treat it as a business and then acting accordingly. Because if, treating it as a side hustle, you're probably looking at things as I'm going to go to some retail stores when I'm done with work or when I have some free time on the weekends. And it's just a thing that you do when when it's convenient or it's just something you do when um, when time allows. But I think when you really, if you want to treat it as a business, you have to make it a priority. Um, you'll, if, even if you're only able to do it part-time, if you schedule out specific hours, you say on Tuesday and Thursday evenings from six to 9 PM, I'm going to dedicate that time to working on Amazon. And then as you're going through, you're not just looking at it as something you're going to do yourself, but you're constantly thinking about how can I outsource in the, this in the future to have someone else on my team do this work so that I can focus on the thing that brings the highest value for my time and generates the most, the most income impact, whatever your goals are for, for your business. So I think, I think it's really just deciding that you want to treat it as a business and then acting accordingly. That's probably the biggest thing. And then a lot of people that do sell on Amazon, um, they aren't, they aren't looking to build a business or they aren't treating it that way. So they're not looking to create systems, processes, be as efficient as possible, things like that. So if you truly want it to be a business, I suggest um, figuring figuring out ways to systematize things as you go along and, and being prepared to bring on additional team members. And you perfectly bring me into my next question because you said bring in more team members and that's something you have to eventually do in business because the responsibilities are just going to keep adding up and you need to delegate certain tasks, but you want to make sure you're not delegating other tasks that you exclusively be doing. So when it comes to the Amazon FBA workload, what are some of the tasks that we should outsource and what are the tasks that we should not even consider outsourcing? Sure. So I, yeah, I'd, I'd say in the long term, it's possible to outsource just about everything. Um, but there's, it definitely takes a long time to build up to that level. So if we look at this from closer to a beginner's perspective, I think one of the first things that should be outsourced is boxing and prepping items to be shipped to the Amazon FBA warehouses. Um, that's a basically, it's basically just shipping and prep. It's like warehouse type work. That's something that's pretty easy to outsource. Um, after that, I like to outsource actually like retail arbitrage buying having people go to the stores for you and purchase those items. And then once you have kind of those two pieces, the next step is to ha actually have someone listing the products for sale on Amazon for you. Um, so that's kind of the progression that I would typically go through is outsourcing the shipping process, then outsourcing the buying process. And then from there, outsourcing actually getting the items listed for sale, pricing the items, things like that. In terms of what not to outsource, Right away, I wouldn't outsource like managing your pricing on Amazon. 
I wouldn't outsource um, like even responding to customer messages, honestly, because Amazon wants you to respond within 24 hours. Um, so that's an important thing that you want to either, if you're going to outsource it right away, you'd need to really trust the person you're giving that to. If not, um, I would handle that yourself for a while. Um, like I'm not doing it anymore. I've got a team member that helps with that. Um, I would outsource as little of the accounting as possible right away. Like if you need help there, definitely get it from an accountant or a CPA, but I would make sure that you really understand your numbers. So I would not Maybe you outsource the bookkeeping, but don't outsource someone telling you how your business is doing. You should under, make sure you put in the time to understand your numbers, especially when things are at a smaller scale, because then you can know what to expect when things grow. And you'll also know if there's a problem arising in the numbers as the business begins to grow, too. Um, so th those are a few general thoughts. But like my overall kind of theory about this is anytime I'm doing a task, um, especially if it's a task I don't like, I'm thinking, is there a way that I could have someone else do this, do this task for me? And then I can dedicate my time to some, something else. And whenever the answer to that question is yes, then it's my goal to figure out a way to outsource that to someone else. So I touched on a few specifics, but you can really apply the methodology to anything. And I, I think with the right systems, you can outsource just about anything. Ryan, thank you for sharing us what we should be outsourcing and what not to outsource in the beginning, but gradually build up to. And it's obvious that you've had to go through a lot of trials and tribulations in order to achieve the success for your Amazon FBA business. And I'm wondering throughout that journey, what was one of the big challenges you faced? Yeah, there's there's one that comes to mind um, in the summer of 2015. Um, my business's Amazon account was actually temporarily suspended. Um, and then effectively what happened was there was one product that we were selling. We bought a liquidation lot of them and they, there were some defective products in the batch uh, that we purchased and we shipped those to Amazon. And then when customers started to receive them, they found out that they didn't work. Uh, and then we got a bunch of returns on that same item within a short period of time. So that led to Amazon basically saying that we couldn't sell on Amazon for the for the time being and that we had to figure out a put a basically put a plan of action in place so that that type of issue wouldn't happen again before that we could get reinstated and continue to sell on Amazon. So that was uh, that was a bit of a scary time. Um, that was a little over two years ago now, but we were able to put a plan of action in place and send that off to Amazon. And we were luckily able to get back on Amazon, get out, get our listings live again within about, it was a day, day and a half to two days. So it was a pretty quick turnaround, but that was a, uh, that was definitely a challenge. It was kind of a scary couple of days wondering, uh, what the impact of that would be. And then ultimately I think it's, it's been, it's turned into a kind of a positive thing. So we're not quite as reliant on Amazon today as we were in the past. And that's, partially due to having that happen to us firsthand. Um, you can see that it can, it can, it can potentially go away pretty quickly, but as it sits today, we were able to overcome it. Then if it was to happen again, um, I'm confident we could overcome it again, but it was definitely a challenge at the time. And how do you check the products now? So you're not sending defects because I mean, uh, someone with like a reputation and all of a sudden like one defect or a few defects mm -hmm. can really do it to you. Yeah. So we're very careful now with the suppliers that we work with and the, the items that we purchased that did lead to the suspension that was purchased via a liquidation or a closeout. Um, so basically, unless we know if, when it comes to liquidations and closeouts, we very rarely purchase them anymore unless we have direct proof that shows that it came directly from the manufacturer and that it's in brand new condition. If it's not, um, then we won't sell it on Amazon. And then we also are very picky on condition. So like before any item gets shipped to FBA warehouses, every single item gets goes through basically a quick visual inspection process to make sure that there's no defects with the packaging, no defects with, or like make sure that the product wasn't opened, things like that. So we, we have checks in place now to make sure that this type of issue or the issue that happened a little over two years ago shouldn't repeat itself. Thank you for sharing with us um, how you 
uh, get picky with your products so that you're able to generate that profit, but also stay on Amazon's good side because obviously I can only imagine how stressful it was during that moment when Amazon decided to temporarily pull the plug, but you were able to overcome that challenge as you've been able to overcome other challenges along your journey. And I'm wondering, what is the best lesson that you have learned throughout that journey? It's a good question. I would say, I mean, the, the best lesson that I've learned um, along the way is, is really just to kind of trust, trust myself um, and know that I can basically I can figure things out. I can accomplish things, um, and that if I want to do something different, I want to expand the business in some way. That I have the ability to do that, and I think that's something that I probably didn't give myself credit for back when I had the job as the accountant because I was afraid of what might happen if things went wrong, um, if I quit my job, and then um, I wasn't able to make the income that I thought I would. So maybe the biggest thing is just self-confidence slash trusting that I'd be able to make things work no matter what. Um, and I think that's been, that's been a really good thing to learn. And I, I think the same would be true for most people out there is if you just go for what you want, most of the time it's either going to work out and then that's awesome, or you're going to learn something in the process. So kind of learning that, um, maybe not articulating it extremely well, but that kind of self-confidence slash going for what you want and understanding that really either way, however it turns out that that's going to be okay. Um, that's been, that's been a good lesson to learn. Thank you for sharing with us that best lesson that you have learned on your journey. And one of the questions that I like to ask as well is, uh, as the bookworm that I am, can you share with us three great books that you can think of right now? Yeah, I've got, uh, Three favorites here. Um, the first is The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. Um, that one is, it, that's, it's basically about mindset, but it's um, focusing on the little decisions that we make every day and the large impact that those have over time. So that, one, that one's been one that I've really enjoyed. I have the audiobook version of that and I listen to it um, at least once a year, I would say. And then the next one on my list is The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Um, that one I read early on before I ever quit my job, and it kind of just opened my eyes to what might be possible in uh, in kind of in the world and in, the, in business as well, and kind of led me to thinking about things in a different way. So The 4-Hour Workweek, I think that's a, that's a great one, especially if you haven't read similar books or things in that uh, realm. And then the third one is Millionaire Fastlane by MJ DeMarco. That one is really about being cognizant about what you're working on and if you're giving yourself a chance to win um, is kind of the way I look at it. It's not really about, it's really not a get rich quick book. It's about finding the ways, um, basically making sure that you're, you're putting yourself on a path to reach your goals. It's like, in a way, like, like Amazon's the real winner in when I'm selling on Amazon, because they get a commission on every sale, they retain the customer information, and things like that. But I'm okay with that in this type in this particular situation, because it it has a lot of upside for me too. But he's basically, or what I took from the book was making sure that you're getting what you want out of what you're doing and making sure that you're putting yourself in a position to win. So that was a book that I really enjoyed as well. Thank you for sharing with us some of the great book recommendations that you've enjoyed. And I've asked you a lot of questions uh, throughout this episode. I'm wondering, what is one question that you believe we need to be asking ourselves more often? Yeah, I think, I think one question that we should be asking more often is, as we're kind of working on things, asking ourselves, is this what I really want to be doing? And is it accomplishing what I want it to do? And I just think a lot of times we we kind of go on autopilot. We get into a default routine. We end up doing the same things over and over again. And we don't exactly know why. But if we take a step back and think about it or think about if it's what we really want to be doing, we might find that there's we do, maybe we don't want to be doing it at all or maybe there's a better way to do it. So I think taking a step back and just kind of asking ourselves if it's what we want to be doing and if it's helping us reach our goals 
those those are something that I think needs to happen more often for most people and basically making sure that they're living intentionally and not just going into autopilot mode. Thank you for sharing us that one question. I feel like it's something that we should be thinking about really deeply because we tend to do the same things over and over again. I mean, we're creatures of habit, but we should really be looking at what we're doing and see if it really matches up with our goals. And I'm greatly appreciative of all of the great insights you provided to Breakthrough Success listeners. And I'm wondering, where can we find you on the web? Yeah, the best place to find me is onlinesellingexperiment.com. That's where I basically share information about selling on Amazon. You can find initial income reports from when I was transitioning from the full-time job to uh, working to build a full-time income, information on how to get started selling on Amazon. So onlinesellingexperiment.com is the best place to find me. Thank you for providing that great resource for us and Breakthrough Success listeners. If you want to see the show notes from Ryan Grant's interview, you can find those at markguberti.com slash E49. Ryan, it was great to have you on the Breakthrough Success podcast. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's been fun. To never miss an episode, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on whatever player you are using. If you are a regular listener and haven't done so already, I would greatly appreciate it if you could give this podcast a review or a rating. Two ways you could do this are through markgaberti.com slash iTunes or markgaberti.com slash Stitcher. That ends this episode. Don't forget, dream big, achieve greatness, and unlock your potential today. How does over 100 retweets per day sound to you? My free ebook, 27 Ways to Get More Retweets on Twitter, has you covered. I use the methods within this ebook to get over 10,000 retweets every single quarter. To learn more and get access to this free resource, visit markgaberti.com backslash retweet. This podcast is a production done by Mark Gaberti. For more insights, head on over to markgaberti.com. <laughs>